The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, hexes, curses, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep from listening to this podcast. This is the Scream Kings podcast. I'm Nathaniel Darkish. And this is Max George. It's not fair. All I get to see are demons, and the podcast gets to see God. <laughs> to be fair, the podcast probably sees more demons than God. Yeah, at least on my end of things. That's true. <laughs> um, well, uh, we are not alone. We have uh, a very wonderful guest returning uh, after uh, her wonderful uh, appearance pretty recently. Uh, we have Laurel K. Hamilton on the show. Welcome uh, back, Laurel. I'm glad, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we, we, we of course had to have her back. One, because she was an utter delight last time. Uh, and, Aww. And, you know, so, so, so obviously that, that's a given. And also, she's just very, very prolific and has dropped not one, but two books this year. Mm-hmm. The second uh, of which... Uh, wait... Uh, it was just two books this year, right? I'm not. Yes, yes, okay. just two. Okay, just two. Um, but but still, that's impressive in its own right. But yes, uh, Slay, uh, and uh, so so the thirtieth book in the Anita Blake series. I'm not hallucinating that, right? You are not hallucinating. Slay oh. is the thirtieth book in the Anita Blake series. Thirty books in thirty years. Uh, one of the reasons you got two books for Anita this year, Smolder in March, and now Slay coming out November 7th, is the fact that I was determined, determined, if there was any way to do it, to get the 30th book in the 30th anniversary year. Uh, because it's 30 years, I believe in October, that Guilty Pleasures was published, the very first Anita Blake novel. And I wanted, if at all possible, to do the 30th book in the 30th anniversary year. And I did it. Uh, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> even Understatement. I, even I'm impressed, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, b- because when I, I still remember when I got the first contract, it was for three books. Uh, Guilty Pleasures was written, and I had most of the second book written because I'd had so many rejections. And so when they did the contract, it was for three books, and I remember being so excited. Because I thought, I, I literally said to myself, at least there'll be three books in the series. And, and little did you know. And here we are. <laughs> I wouldn't have believed it That's if you had told me this. Uh, but then how many people get to write a series for this long and have it continue to be popular and read? I mean, I, I mean, I, it, there's nothing better than writing what you want to write and having people love it. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm glad that you have found your readership. I'm sure your readership is glad that they have found you. This is, uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah. Your 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 career is just super impressive. Uh, you know, as as a writer, I'm just want to be able to replicate, you know, just your prolificness much. Uh, but but yeah, being able to have a, a series go strong that long is just such a, a thing for uh any uh, writer to to uh, aspire to if, if you know they're uh, yeah. a series writer yeah uh you know the, a lot of people write series but but and you know i've been trying to think about it i was trying to think and there are there have to be some mystery series oh. this is this is probably i i may be the only horror horror, dark fantasy, paranormal thriller, whatever you want label uh, is on the side of my books currently. Um, Probably the one in this genre to go this far and this long, this fast. But I'm not sure on that. Um, But I don't know of any right off the top of my head. But you usually have to go to mystery to get to be able to do this. And um, so I I am just... Slay, and I get to, I I don't know if you guys got a a chance to read Slay or not. Um, I did not get to read it. Um, I, or more accurately, we we did have an advanced copy sent over, but 
then I went, I have read one book, and I do not want to, to have 28 books uh, spoiled for me all at once. Oh, so, okay. Um, so so then... I decided to to withhold a little bit, though I, I do know a, a little bit, um, you know, just from, from the promotional materials that, that uh, were sent to us. I, I am actually, I'm actually really, I, I get new readers all the time. That's one of the reasons that I'm still, you know, being able to write the Anita Blake series and it's still growing. And I am actually having a lot of problems. I'm 30 books in, and I have new readers coming in. So how do I not have spoilers? Yeah. It, 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 it's, like, it's like, guys, I'm sorry, but, but, but you're, you're, you're 10 books behind. You're 15 books behind. I don't know how to have a conversation about this book if you haven't read that without giving stuff away. Well, give away anything that, that you want to give away. I... You know, this is this is on me for not, you know, uh, ha- have, having the the uh, reading. Uh... No, I understand if you're wanting to read the series in order. That there are a lot of surprises, and the, there are a lot of surprises because there's character growth, and the world changes. I mean, Anita starts off as a. Uh, a bounty, basically a bounty hunter that works with the police to slay vampires because they're too dangerous to put in jail. By the time you're here in the series, she's a U.S. Marshal with the Preternatural Branch and has a badge of her own. Uh, you know, we start the series with uh, just four years after, four years after Addison B. Clark, which was the court case that gave vampires legal rights as citizens. Um, they still can't vote at that point, and their taxation with that representation, but, but they're legal citizens, and you can't kill them just for being vampires. And this, the first book picks up just four years after that. So, uh, and now here we are this far forward, and um, the politics have moved on, and different things in the world have changed. So it's, a, it's sort of an alternative... It, some people say it's an alternative timeline, so it's really science fiction. And it is, but it's also genuinely horror and genuinely mystery. And um, because there are relationships in it, some people think of it as romance, but I do not think that traditional romance readers would be happy with every book. A little Fair too enough. much violence. Well, you know, they just need to, to branch out a little bit. Um... <laughs> I mean, I'm all about that. The what 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 I I I like about this series, what I find really compelling about this, is that you do consider a lot of the kind of nuances of the world, right? That this isn't just, um, you know, oh, there's there's secret magic, and and we you know can just kind of wink and nod to it, but then like everyone just pretends like it's not really having any real impact on the world. I like that you know, vampires are having a real impact on the world, that it is informing court cases, that there is, you know, questions about uh, legality of killing them, and, you know, all of that. That, to me, that that makes this world feel so much more fleshed out and thought through in a way that makes me, you know, want to dive in more. Um, Yeah, I feel like a lot of the, you know, kind of urban fantasy and stuff that sort of kind of branched out after you you know, sort of broke ground for a lot of those mm-hmm. tropes for the genre. Um, don't play with those kind of ideas nearly uh, as well as as you do with, with the series because, yeah, it's usually just wink, wink, nod, nod. Well, a couple cops know that there's actually monsters and ghosts and stuff, but everyone else is just blissfully ignorant, and that doesn't do it for me. Well, I think one of the reasons that I'm still going strong and a lot of the people that came in after, uh, you know, they re- get into a certain point in their series and, and you, they just start losing steam. I think part of it is that this is what I want to write. Mm-hmm. I didn't jump on the bandwagon because it was popular. I was, in, I was in the front in the jungle slashing my way through to get the genre accepted. And uh, this is what I want to write. I did the world building. I did my research. I did, and I continue to do research. The world continues to grow with each book. I get more plot ideas, more book ideas. If I could figure out how to do it, 
I would hive off some of the characters that aren't getting enough screen time in the main series to their own series, but I, there's only so much of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are characters that do not get enough screen time that I love, and they're very interesting, but it's, it's a first-person narration, so I'm limited. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I'm still going strong is the fact that this was my world to begin with, and I did make it deep and wide. And uh, I'm also a biologist. I call it a non-practicing biologist, which means I've never made my living at it, which many of us don't. Um, but I think that also, the science background, also means that my wear animals, and you, you accept that vampires are real, but I, I am one of the few people that have looked at how that might work physically. And I just look at it all the way down, nitty gritty nuts and bolts. And I think that a lot of people that came to what's become the paranormal genre, they came from genres that aren't science-based. They didn't come from science fiction. They didn't come from uh, horror. Um, they came from you know, either straight fantasy or they came from more traditional romance. And, and if you want to hear me uh, rant and rave on a soapbox for far too long, uh, have somebody tell me that it's a fantasy world. You don't have to do research. I, I've had so many people tell me that. It's horror. You don't have to do research. Um, the more fantastic a thing you ask somebody to believe, the better your reality better be. Oh, see, see, this is so refreshing to me to hear because, yeah, I, I feel like when uh, some writers do, you know, don't do their due diligence when, when they're writing, you know, in genre fiction, that's, that's what gives genre fiction a bad rap sometimes, right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah, when, when, when people are, are, you know, phoning in basically what is little more than, than poorly uh, conceived fan fiction, they're not doing the world building. They're not, you know, doing oh. the, the things that, that really make, I think, for good, interesting, compelling writing. Well, I think, I think the, the, just call it, I think that, that was a little harsh, but, um, uh, uh, but for some people, they, the, the writing is good, but they don't, they don't put in the background. They don't do the world building and stuff. And, and I've talked to some, some quite, quite well-selling writers who still seem to me to not do their due diligence on world building and research. And um, it drives me a little bit nuts. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do in Slay is there is, uh, I don't know if the advanced copy has it, but there is a list of the research that I did. Mm. I, I list all the books I researched. I listed uh, magazine articles. I listed some websites. I listed the research that went into this, to this book and Smolder because they were written so close together that some of it overlapped. And um, I, I want to put it out there. I've been told that by editors that I do more research for my fiction than most people do for their nonfiction. And first of all, that should be scary to you um, mm. because some of the nonfiction is, is important things that you, you're depending on. But I don't understand. You need to give people a world to stand in. Before you scare the heck out of them, before you make them, you have to make them believe in the world, care about the characters, or it doesn't matter. Uh, to to uh, quote the the lingo of the youths of, of today that I am constantly around, uh, slay queen. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, yes. I, 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 I agree completely because... Um, yeah, like I, I think this is is what makes the difference between, you know, someone who is a fan of the genre but doesn't understand it, trying to create within that space, and actually, yeah, like having the depth and and really, you know, people people can be great at writing interesting prose. They can be great at characterization. They can be great at a lot of these kind of key skills for writing, but. If you're going to be, I think, a, a truly standout writer within genre fiction, yeah, you have to be willing to put in the work 
to make your world real. And and sometimes that is, you know, just world building and, and thinking critically through this stuff. But yeah, a lot of times it is research. You know, I've, I've had to do a bunch of research for the uh, novel that I'm currently floating around uh, with agents and we'll see how that goes. But um, thank you. You're welcome. But, but yeah, like it's, it's been so much more about making sure I understand it. And, and yeah, for me, you know, I have had the, the delight of like learning new things about in, in the case of my book, you know, uh, dementia and, and how it works and, and finding new interesting things that have let me write more scary, fun scenes and, and bring more depth to, to my story than just, you know, if I had gone in blindly and just like, well, I got this idea and hope for the best. Um, if you're so, if you're doing something with with medical violence medical that kind of thing the more research you do the better your horror will be because the real research is terrifying mm -hmm. um, the you know uh, uh, dementia is on the rise I, I did that come up I'm sure that came up in your research that dementia is on the rise and at younger ages now Yep, it is, and um, but 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 we are starting to get some some new and uh, interesting insights on it at the very least too. Uh, uh, one recent theory that I came up with, I'll share this briefly because you know rabbit holing, but um, is that one idea is I was looking up. I have allergies. I'm allergic to everything. My sister is too, and uh, you know, not my home planet is what our doctor says. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the theories behind it now, and on the allergies is pretty solid, is that early use of antibiotics killed off our gut biome. Mm -hmm. And so that's why allergies so long, so early and so strong and more of them, because we are just decimating our internal system. But they've now made a connection, a theory. It has not been proven. I don't know how they're going to even go about that between dementia and the same issue. Because of the brain and the gut, the brain and the gut are so much more connected. They may actually be the same system in a way that we just don't understand. And by killing off the gut bi biome in the gut, that we are actually damaging our ability for our brain to function. Yeah, I, I, I love that, that, that we're able to, to like get these kinds of insights because, yeah, like that in, in and of itself can, can make for you know, something that's really insightful and, you know, interesting, you know, in terms of just, like, medical discussion in a book, but it could also, like, yeah, make for an interesting scare or an, an interesting, um, you know, magic system or whatever, you know, genre, you know, you, you want to do with it. But, like, I love how that in inherently just has so much more depth that you can then play with, right? Well, yes, and one of the old tropes in science fiction for so long has been a brain in a box. That mm -hmm. all, all you need to have the person is the brain. But if the brain and the gut are all one system, really, in a way that we don't quite understand yet, then you wouldn't have the person. It wouldn't work. So any other things that you want to say about Slay to get people stoked to read this book. <laughs> well, okay. Smolder and Slay are set very close together uh, time-wise. So Smolder's about to come out in paperback and Slay coming out in hardback in November. And s there is so many things that fans have been asking and that I've been wanting to do that I got to do in this book. And I, I'm trying not to give things away because, like I said, I get new readers with every book. And, and I don't know where everybody is. And I've had some people really cry foul lately on um, me, me spoiling things for them. But I don't know how not to. Um, well, well, here's what we'll do. We'll say, um, uh, you know, new readers who don't want anything spoiled, cover, or, you know, just uh, unplug your uh, headphones for... The next 30 seconds and then you know after 30 seconds plug it back in and then and then you know they, they'll miss the spoiler 
I'll try to talk fast then, so here we go. Um, you finally get to see Anita's family uh, on stage, uh, her father, her stepmother Judith, and her uh, stepsister and her half-brother, and grandmother Blake. Um, you get to see her deal with the fact that her family is Catholic and very, very seriously Catholic, and she is marrying a vampire, which to the church it means that he is demonic, at best, and if not, uh, he is a lost soul because he's dead and you can't repent. And um, her family is just as unpleasant about that as you think it's going to be. That that was very, very unpleasant family interactions. And um, if you're looking for a heartwarming family moment, you're not going to get it here. Mm -hmm. um, you, I, I will not. I will say her father comes out better than I thought he was going to at the beginning of the book. Uh, you have her planning a, planning a marriage with a you know the the first vampire king of America, and um, he still even though he is like 600 years old he is still nervous to meet the family of his intended. He has to sit there and get grilled just like you would any other time. No amount of supernatural powers saves you from the father looking across the table at you and going. What are this your intentions is, with my daughter? Exactly, and I have to say that I had so much fun writing the scene in some ways because the fact that Jean-Claude is suave and debonair and over 600 years old and it does not help him. <laughs> it does not help him in this moment was actually pretty fun. Um, and you get background information from his when he was alive uh, that you haven't had on stage before in the books. And then you also have a series of murders and hate group, uh, people who hate the supernatural. And you get some pretty, pretty horrible things happening. I don't want to give the mystery away. And the idea is, is it possible to be a big enough fish to keep all the other sharks from eating you? Or is it the bigger you get, the more you attract even bigger sharks? Ooh, dun dun dun. And and that's really I, I don't want to give anything away, but that really is the the question is in especially in the supernatural, is a vampire, can you be a big enough shark that there's nothing out there big enough to eat you back? Uh love that. Uh well I'm very excited uh to see how how this uh, enthralls everybody. Obviously, you know, I've, I've got catching up to do. But, you know, that's great. That, that sets up uh, my, my reading for the next couple of years. It'll be... It'll be <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 had, I had one person on TikTok saying that, that, that my series was a, was a commitment. She equated to marriage and, and serious dating. And I'm going... <clears throat> I had never thought of it that way, but because mm -hmm. that th th it's a commitment, and I, I think I'm kind of proud of that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess it really depends on how quick you read, too, right? Like, some people that 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 could be all of their reading for the rest of their life, and for me, that's like a, a good month if I, you know, I'm keeping on top of it. Uh, when the series was only 16 books, I had. Uh, a person at one of the signings when I was touring, doing it across the country. And uh, they said they'd read all of the books, all of the books in like uh, nine days. Dang. 16 wow. books, nine days. And I just looked at them and I'm, 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 I'm si taking their book to sign. I'm, I'm going, wow. I said, that may be a record. I said, did you not sleep? And they said, not really. I said, how did you get it? Do you not work? I mean, to have that kind of time. And they said, oh, no, I, I work in a nuclear power plant. Hmm. And I just stared up at them and went, this is not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to be my fault. And that and, person worked at Three Mile Island. <laughs> uh, no, timing's wrong on that one. But yes, I was actually, yes, yes. I will look for that cloud on the other side of the country, and it's my fault. <laughs> Somehow it's my fault. Uh, Still so, strangely flattering as a, as a writer to be like, well, I mean, the world ended, but... My books were just that enthralling. Uh, my, 
I have to say the my most favorite thing to be uh, blamed for was uh, a woman, attractive woman, comes, sits down a picture, slaps down a picture in front of me of three children, three young children, and she points to the youngest, the baby. She says, that one's yours. Hmm. And I looked up at her and said, I think I'd remember that. <laughs> and she and she said that she she was reading my books and she was sharing the books with her husband and got carried away and forgot her birth control. Ah, oh goodness. So she she says that one was mine and I'm going, "Okay. That too is flattering." I I mean, you know, but but unexpected. Yeah. I mean, did did the the child have have a name from one of your characters or something? No, that that, that would have really clinched it. You know, I actually I get a lot of people using the character names and complaining that Anita's name is not interesting enough and Jean Claude is not interesting enough. They wish they had different names; they would use them. Um, the name Asher is one of my characters. It's it climbed into the top one hundred or higher, and um, and several people. And I'm, go I'm looking at the timing going, I think that's my fault. Um, you brought but it back into the public consciousness. Apparently. And uh, the biggest thing is uh, Mike and Nathaniel. Or Nathan Mike and Nathaniel the, is the most used boy's name from my characters. That's the one that's used the most. Uh, that's two characters put together as one name. And mm -hmm. I am flattered. It is flattering that people love my characters that much. But... Um, you know, as a writer, you don't expect that. You don't expect that. You expect to tell your stories, and reach your audience, and share your stories, but you never think about having, or at least I didn't. Maybe I'm not an egomaniac enough for this, but it never occurred to me that I would have that kind of direct impact on, on people's lives. But people have complained to me about some of my names, that they weren't they didn't want to name their babies, but they'd like to name them after my characters. So when I put together the new series uh, that there's just one book out in uh, Terrible Fall of Angels, the Zaniel Havelock uh, series beginning. I actually chose the names so they'd be pretty. They'd be better baby names. Hmm. I really did put some thought that some of the names would be better baby names uh, because I've had so many people over the years tell me that they wished Anita and Jean-Claude's names were different. And that's how you know you got them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, it, it, amazing problem to have, a wonderful problem to have, but I did put thought into it for the, new, for the newest series. Well, that's great. All right, well, should we shift gears a little bit and talk about the movie you, uh, well, well you, you gave us a list of, of potential movies, and uh, when, when uh, Max and I were looking uh, over the, the movies, just the, the premise of this one grabbed us, and we are like, yes, that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So, so we are talking Frailty uh, from 2001, directed by Bill Paxton. Yes, the actor Bill Paxton. Mm -hmm, uh, and uh, written by Brent Hanley. And right off the bat, before we even get into the plot or anything, which we'll get to in a second, of course, uh, I, I find it really interesting that, yeah, this is uh, a relatively uh, unique piece because, yeah, Bill Paxton only directed a handful of things. Um, including, I guess, a music video for the song Fish Heads. Uh, <laughs> but that was one of his only other th things that he's directed, and Brent Hanley only had a couple of things that he had written. And so, yeah, this is kind of a, a unique, you know, one-and-done sort of uh, film uh, as far as their uh, efforts uh, from, from these roles. And I'm really surprised because the film seems very polished to me. And uh, I thought the writing was very strong and the directing was very strong. So I was surprised about that. Yeah, same. Um, yeah, this, this doesn't feel like a, like a first feature for, for those elements. And it, yeah, it, it, it is, surprisingly. So I, I like when people can come out of the gate with, with something this well-constructed. Um, Agreed. <clears throat> So before we get into things we liked and things we didn't like, let's talk a little bit just about the the plot. Do you want to do the honors of giving us a super condensed, you know, what 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 is this movie about? If you want super condensed, I am not the girl. Okay, <laughs> maybe not super condensed, lightly condensed. You I know, can as long go as, as 
as well, Nathaniel, if we want to give Laura a break here. I, 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 okay, I, I will just say this. Anytime I was in drama, if I had to present a play to potentially do, I would tell so much about it that nobody wanted to do it by the time. They just wanted to leave. So please, please do this instead of me. Okay, awesome. Uh, the premise is actually fairly simple in its approach, which I thought was really great. Uh, essentially, the opening credits allude to some sort of serial killer in the town, and the plot of the film is Matthew McConaughey's... I, I, I butcher his name every time, so you guys are going to get six or seven different rendition of Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> that's that, that's the correct one. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um, he arrives at a police precinct and essentially tells the captain that he knows who the serial killer is. It's actually his brother. And we then go on kind of a series of flashbacks about their family. Uh, when he, Matthew was a, a young boy, he and his brother uh, lived with their dad. He was a... Um, a divorcee, I think. No, uh, their, a their widower. mom died. Widower. A widower, excuse me. Yes, thank you. And he, the dad, gets a vision from God that there are demons that walk among the earth, and it is his special calling to find them and kill them, which we have heard countless times through religion, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the real tragic part, I think, about the plot is how he, one, convinces the younger son that these things are true, and he just dives in full-heartedly, and the other son really does not believe his father at all. But the tragedy here is the dad kind of forces them to come with him when he is hunting these innocent people, and takes them back to their house and kills them with his sons. Mm-hmm. So the, the plot of the movie really is just a series of flashbacks trying to kind of understand the dad and is this real, is it not? Was the dad just kind of insane? And at the end of the movie, there is a big plot reveal. And this is where I'm going to pass the baton over to Nathaniel. Yeah, uh, so basically we find out that one, uh, Matthew McConaughey's character is not the son. Uh, okay, of... okay. May may I may I may I add one yes, thing. Yes, 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 yes. If anybody wants to watch Frailty without the twist being revealed, this is your time to to stop listening. Yes. You have been warned. This is your only warning. Now, reveal the twist. <laughs> yes. There we go. Yeah, because yeah, unfortunately, yeah, this is one of those movies we can't talk about without getting into the twist in uh, great detail. Uh, but yes, so Matthew McConaughey's character, um, you know, who's been talking about his brother this whole time, he introduced himself initially as Fenton, who is the older brother, who is kind of resisting things, but it turns out he's actually Adam, the younger brother. Uh, and so um, he, you know, the kind of the, the revelation here is that he has picked up his father's um, holy task of, of killing demons while uh, his uh, older brother Fenton has become a serial killer mm -hmm. who is basically taunting him through these serial killings and ultimately uh, Adam, uh, adult Adam Matthew McConaughey's character has killed uh, his, his brother um, and is actually using all of this to lure the FBI agent he's talking to um, to the scene of, of where he has, you know, buried his... Uh, victims. Yeah, his victims, the, the demons, and this FBI agent is actually one of those demons. Um, and and, and we, we get a confirmation, actually, that, that this is, in fact, a divine um, crusade uh, because uh, Adam gets, like... By, by touching uh, Agent Doyle, there we go, I got the, the character's names in front of me, um, he gets this like vision of um, Agent Doyle having murdered his mother, you know, years ago, and then, yeah, kills him, uh, you know, and then we, we find out that uh, Adam is actually the the local sheriff and has been you know kind of setting this up and, and keeping his holy crusade so so we actually have you know multiple people killing uh lots of people uh some of them uh are, are that are being killed are apparently actual demons uh or you know evil people that uh, that qualifies them for demonhood i don't that doesn't exactly 
become clear. But um, and then and then we had a, another serial killer who is uh, taunting his his brother. Well, one of the things I loved about the movie is that it set up as classic schizophrenia. The father is 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 doing classic schizophrenia symptoms. He starts hearing voices, he starts seeing God, he starts seeing demons. And if you went into any psychiatrist's office with this, they would say you're having a psychotic break. It's it's or schizophrenia or something. It, it's mm. your brain chemistry has gone off the rail. And the viewpoint initially being the older son that doesn't believe him. His older son is like uh, probably 12, you think, when in yeah, about, about 12. Yeah. And, and uh, Adam is only about 8 to 10. Mm-hmm. And so one of the interesting things to me is that uh, the classic schizophrenia presentation for the father, the 12-year-old immediately goes, this isn't okay, this isn't right, something's wrong with dad. But the younger brother believes, and... One of the things I thought this movie showed very, very well was that smaller, ch- as a young child, you believe your family. Mm-hmm. Uh, Agreed. You don't know that you're in an abusive situation sometimes until somebody else tells you or you see how other families live. How your family lives and does their daily life is everything to a small child. And that's their reality. The t- I, I agree with that too, and I really liked the dichotomy that we saw, the the older son is probably on the precipice of puberty, right? The, yeah. The brain chemistry is going to change completely. There's a re- lot of kind of inherent rebellion that will be popping up against his father. Um, and then just the genuine belief of the other kid. Um, and there's that even that one scene where the older brother is trying to tell his younger brother, like, hey, you saw dad, like, kill people. To be Santa Claus. Like, Maybe this is not all what it seems, and that younger son just can't veer from that. And I think what you said, kids believe, kids are trusting. you got to be careful with that. Well, and also, you have to trust your parents because they're who will keep you alive. At some level, one of the things that can mess you up as a child if you are in an abusive situation, especially a small one, is that at some level you know that your whole life depends on that parent taking care of you. Mm-hmm. And and if you can't depend on the parent to take care of you, that is one of the most terrifying moments as a small child as a younger child to realize you're at the mercy of somebody who may not be who who may be crazy, who may be cruel who may be whatever and they have to be okay because you need them to be okay yeah and something i i I really like about this and and kind of how it's presented and and specifically yeah that that choice that like yeah it's the younger brother that is 100 percent on board with everything and the older brother is not is that like that that's really consistent with the writing all the way through because you know early on it tells us uh, that uh, Adam, um, when he was born, like, you know, mom died in childbirth. So yes. he has never had another parent. He has never had any other person to turn to. You know, basically his dad is his whole, you know, idea of what a parent is. While Fenton has had another parent. He has those experiences. He has those memories. And so I think that's maybe part of why we see them go different directions with this um in addition to the supernatural elements because you know we we also find out later that adam is seeing the visions that his father is seeing when he touches them uh touches the demons but but yeah i like you know just from a pure like you know if if you take all of the supernatural elements out that's still like really consistent with probably their lived experiences and i i really like that about this i really did too and i thought the movie did a very good job of setting up at the beginning how idyllic the father and the two boys were that it was a good family Mm -hmm. and Uh, i also really appreciated the kind of subtlety behind the entire film it didn't need to show extreme amounts of gore or even violence the real horror was this kind of weird conflict with a father and his children. So the movie is is very clean. I was surprised it was rated R for a while, and then they started dropping the F word. Uh, 
it was just very interesting how they could create that tension and that horror. You know, nowadays, if there's not enough blood, we are a little weirded out. Well, but, but really, this is psychological horror. Mm. For sure. Even though, even though you see the murders, and, and, it's, and some of it's pretty gory, and the fact that uh, some of it's done by the children is, is, is shocking. Um, but the conflict is, is almost not about the murder. It is about yeah. what is reality? What is belief? And um, that, and, and you, you think that Matthew Potenhay's character is the older brother Fenton. You think that Adam is the one that's the serial killer right up into the point in the movie when he says, when the FBI agent says, well, that doesn't make any sense, and Matt Conahay says, his character says, well, it makes perfect sense if, I, if I'm actually Adam. And then you go, wait, what? Yeah. Uh, did either of you see it coming, though? I did. I you... also kind of got the vibe, especially towards the latter part in the car. Um, there was kind of a shift in the atmosphere, I think, between the police captain and Matthew McConaughey. FBI agent. FBI, sorry. It got more disturbing. The shadows got darker, yes. Um, but I still, didn't, I still didn't know where we were going with it. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> um, and the fact that the demons are people who have committed crimes... Like the FBI agent killed his mother. Uh, one of the earlier victims was a pedophile. Another one was domestic abuser. Um, that that the fathers said he'd never killed anybody uh, because they they were demons. They were evil, um, and and he believed that sincerely, mm-hmm. just as Adam did. Adam had never killed anybody because they were all demons. They're not people. Yeah. And and I found that idea really interesting that it seemed like it was like hey, at a certain level of sin, they sent they they turned into a demon. Like that was kind of an interesting take on kind of, you know, looking at that sort of, sort of some of the religious ideas present in this because yeah, usually it's like, oh, that, that's the sinner. They deserve it. But it was like, you know, he specifically said that, like, he had to wait until God put um, his brother on the list to be able to kill him. You know, like, he his, his brother had to do a certain amount of serial killing before um, he reached demon status, I guess. And I thought that was an interesting concept. Because it meant that you were not a murderer. Mm-hmm. You... You were doing God's work. You were not a murderer. Which, I mean, I think we can probably get into this a little bit when we talk about the cons, but for me, I really kind of struggled with this premise that this deity, God, has chosen a man to punish other sinners by sinning himself. What makes his murder not a sin, but these other individuals who, you know, are doing terrible things, of course... Why are they any less than this man who is committing murder? It, it just didn't track very well for me. It, it kind of felt like they were throwing God under the bus. God's the bad guy. Uh, to me, it seemed like the interpretation for the father and the, the son that followed in his footsteps was very Old Testament. That, mm. that the Old Testament, the New Testament's not included in, in this idea that that it's okay to kill if they're evil. And um, Old Testament's written in a time when, when you know, violence was every day. No, sure. I mean, I understand that. But the, the context of the film was he, you know, Michael, St. Michael came down to him with a flaming sword. He had that vision. It, That's it, very it, Revelations, very New Testament kind it of was, framed. It, it within, was... They never actually said it was Michael, but yes, it probably was supposed to be. Um, and, uh, and and yes, that is bothersome because at that point in the movie, you think he's he's crazy. You mm-hmm. don't believe it. We 
and, and I think we were all okay with it just being psychosis, that, that it wasn't God telling him to do anything. What really, what really turned it into horrific, um, I, I, I think I would, that, you know, it's, it's like really good horror short stories. At the very end, they do that twist that drives the knife home. And at the end, when you find out that that it's not uh, that everything the father said was true, that mm-hmm. that the videotape, the videotape of 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 Adam going in to the FBI thing, all the tapes are ruined, so you can't use them. That the man who actually looked at him and shook and and saw him with the FBI agent, he sees him again as the sheriff in the uniform, shakes his hand and doesn't recognize him because God protects them. They're doing God's work. And that was the twist at the end that made me go, oh my God, that was the, that was the horror. That was that thing at the end that makes it, that sinks the horror home, drives the knife deep and goes, everything you thought you knew was wrong. And it's even worse than you thought. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I do like that, that you bring that up because that is, does make the horror further reaching, right? You know, it's, it's, it's horrifying to watch this family dynamic become corrupted, and that's what we think the horror is. But then it becomes something else when it's like, hey, the horror is that, you know, the idea that God has an agent who is going and killing people and is basically untouchable, you know, in terms of, you know, yeah, no, no camera can see him when he's doing this work. No, no one is going to recognize him. Like that is in and of itself kind of a, a new upsetting idea. So I am coming around to that element of the, the twist more and more um, as as I chew over it more and as, as, as we've talked about it. Um, I'm a little divided, but I'm still... But I, I like that there is kind of this nuance to that idea that, like, yeah, maybe even God's methods are horrifying and, like, yeah, that, that does make it more horrific for us as the viewers. Um, and I I just want to chime in again, too. I think it's, it's interesting. Again, like, I am not a religious person. Um, I left Christianity for a lot of problems I think that it has. Um, and so watching it kind of from that context these individuals who are hunting demons who's the real demon here is it the people who are making sins or is it god who is allowing the sins and then also allowing an individual to kill these people like i kept thinking of like a cost risk analysis here i mean god has more murders on his hand than these people who are doing these terrible things so who is the demon well, I mean, it goes on the old line that 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 if you read the book of Job, and the that if if that is a parable, it is a lesson, and that's it's okay. But if you sure. read that, is God allowed that to actually happen to His most devout person? Then suddenly, it it doesn't feel like God's the good guy here. No, not at all. I would argue that He is the antagonist in this film. And and. And I can't argue that, but you don't understand that that's what's happening till the very end. Mm. And, and that's, for me, what made it horror rather than just a psychological thriller is that the, the supernatural element coming in and nailing the most disturbing thing home. Um, and I didn't actually have philosophical problems with the idea of did God do this or did God not do this um, because uh, I still saw it as a psychotic break. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, if you wanted to, you could also do the whole thing that maybe he's psychic. Did God, maybe he's psychic and that nobody remembers him if he doesn't want them to. Is it is it is it God doing that, or is that just his belief is so strong that it affects things around him? And I think that's a good thought experiment. But again, within the context of the film, it's very religious focused. And I would go back yes. to the, 
the angel with the flaming sword. I mean, that is a very deliberate iconography for St. Michael. It, it is. It is. Um, Michael would not have anything to do with that. I just, just you know, he gets a bad rap sometimes. Um, <laughs> but, um, yes, it, it is, but it is very Old Testament. It is Old yeah. Testament as if, as if New Testament didn't exist almost. Um, so, again, I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit on that because oftentimes when I talk to Christians and I bring up these problematic things, they, they say that deflection that, oh, it's just the Old Testament. It's just, that's how it was. It's not how it was now. That's not true. I mean, there are thousands of examples. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reading a book about Jims Jones who took New Testament teachings and committed mass murder. Uh, we look at any yeah. sort of mass murder cult in the United States and it's not Old Testament teachings, it's New Testament. Well, what it is is the New Testament is I find that, especially on, on cults, the New Testament is the sugar on top. And then the reinterpretation of the New Testament, bringing in the Old Testaments that uh, is what's underneath. No, is you cannot separate old from new because old and new are both still taught as, as Christianity. It's both still Christianity. You're absolutely right. Um, I think what I'm getting at is it doesn't really matter Old or New Testament. It's that Christianity Christianity has been used as reasoning to murder people. Mm -hmm. And yes. that's not okay. Regardless if it's based in Old Testament values, New Testament values, um, the Christian God has killed more people than I think any other God. <laughs> or at least people have done it in his name. It, that is my intent here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I cannot... I, I cannot do a body count here um, uh, on 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 that. I'm saying, but I will say that he's got a high score. Uh, <laughs> uh, high, you know, a uh, high score in this area in a bad way. Um, I think that more harm has been done in the name of religion than... I, it, it's pretty bad. Uh, it's pretty bad if you do any research into uh, the witch trials. I'm yeah. Wiccan. I'm Wiccan. You know, I'm a witch. That's my path of faith. So you, I've done real research into some of the transcripts the torturers kept for that. That'll. I'm sorry. That that is serial killer stuff. That yeah, is no, no. that is church. That was church sanctioned serial killing. Yeah, especially if you look at any of the European stuff. You know, we always talk about Salem, but Salem was small oh, potatoes. That was tame compared to Europe. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Uh, um, you know, um, and the, I mean, there were towns in, there were some small towns where they killed every woman, every female between the age of like 12 up. They just, everyone, every woman was dead, accused of witchcraft uh, in some parts of Europe. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And sorry, I don't, I don't want to sidetrack us too far from the movie here i just it's one of my soapboxes that i like to stand on every now and then <laughs> well i think the movie did a good job of showing how religion can be used to justify horrible things and i agree um but I, it, this is why i didn't like the twist though because I can understand if someone is doing terrible things with religion as their cause, it's a little bit harder to swallow when you think of a loving God ordaining this kind of behavior. I, I was Episcopalian at one point, I am, and I'm not, I, I didn't leave the church because I got angry at God. I have no problem with God and Jesus. Some of the people that call themselves Christian, very unchristian, so that was a problem. But. Um, I can see where you'd have a problem with this because the movie's twist at the end does does seem to say very clearly that God really did sanction all this killing and he's behind it. So, And, and, and I think for me the, the thing even was, you know, okay, I, I can at least understand why it's killing all these people. The, the one that I was most resistant to was, hey, let's just throw your son... Uh, in, in a uh, basically prison with no food uh, and very little water for uh, like a month. And, you know, so that level of just demented child abuse being part of God's plan is, is the thing that kind of... 
Yeah, upsetting by, me the most. Uh, that that's frustrating too, Nathaniel, because God is allowing you know pedophiles, sure, um, other murderers, sure, to be murdered. But what about this other guy? This champion of the divine is torturing his innocent kid. Like it's it's hard to swallow. Well, they actually reference in the movie that you know God asked Abraham to kill his son. But he, they even say, but, but God did not have pity on my father. Mm -hmm. And so they actually reference that. They actually come right out and do the one-on-one the -on -one reference there. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, I, but at least Abraham didn't, you know, uh, put his, his son on a starvation uh, thing for a, a solid month before uh, go, taking him up to sacrifice him. The Abraham and Isaac story as well, I feel like, again, is used a lot of times when Christians try and defend terrible actions that they do. And I, again, I think we're straying a little far from the actual movie. Um, but it, Yes, I, but I can see I, that it raised, it raised very serious concerns. Uh, but, but, but I love that, that, that it was the kind of movie that makes us have these ha discussions yes exactly yeah, it's that... a testament to its power one of the things one of the reasons that i suggested this movie is that for me the horror movies that i truly think of as horror horrific is in the definition of horrific are the ones that i watch and in, and i can't just leave alone i go back and think about it it keeps coming i keep poking at it and and thinking about it because I think that at its heart, the best horror doesn't just horrify you. The best horror makes you think. Mm -hmm. And this is a movie that makes you think. For sure. I do want to clarify, I did not leave Christianity because I was mad at God. <laughs> I, I, I know I sound like I'm very feisty with God. Um, I believe in a God in a different type of way, but just want to put that out there for all our listeners. <laughs> the reason I the reason I phrased it the way is that a lot of uh, a lot of people, especially women in the in the witch community, is a faith. Uh, a lot of them are no. angry with God. They they left because the church failed them, and they threw the baby out with the bathwater no. when they became. And I am not. I'm one of the few people that, uh, more and more, but back 20 years ago when I first became Wiccan, I was one of the few women that wasn't raging. I wasn't angry at the church. I wasn't angry at God. I just, it just didn't, it wasn't my path of faith. I was called elsewhere. And so that's why I phrased it that way. Mm -hmm. And, but you know. Um, I'm back. Sorry. Everybody comes to their own path in their own way. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, people come to the door and, you know, knock on your door for proselytizing. And I, my faith does not allow me to proselytize. I am not allowed to recruit people to my path of faith. If, if goddess and God do not call you to my path of faith, then it's not meant for you. And I cannot proselytize for you. I cannot, I cannot entreat you or convert you. You really do have to have your own road to Damascus witchy moment. I cannot give it to you. Which I, and that's one of the interesting things about this path of faith as opposed to Christianity and mm -hmm. all the Abrahamic, well, a lot, of the, a lot of the major religions is that they proselytize. They recruit people. And uh, I think that really that your religion, your path of faith, should be very personal. I agree. Fair enough. Um, Nathaniel, anything final you'd want to say about the film? I think we've kind of covered <laughs> a lot. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I enjoyed most of the performances pretty well. Like, yeah, like, I, you know, kind of going back just to one of the first things we said, you know, like, this is a very cohesive film that I, I feel was very well made and I yeah again I just love that that this is the kind of thoughtful discussion that that this sort of film has has naturally um, called for like that's 
it's it's not very often that you know I, I watch a movie and then I feel like oh yeah like we can have like you know an hour plus discussion you know considering the the themes and all of that so I I just love that that you chose this movie because um, I love having these kinds of discussions about you know whether it's film or a book or whatever that you know that it has that level of depth um, so thank you well you're welcome um, I. I, I like things I can chew on. I, I do too. have to say, I would be remiss if I did not mention that one of the child actors is Jeremy Sumter. He grew up to play Peter Pan and awakened the gayness inside me. So thank you, Jeremy <laughs> Sumter. <laughs> okay, well, I, I didn't know that that was going to be... Uh, well, that's cool. He was, he was a crush for a lot of Indeed. people. Yeah, he's a cute kid. And adult. Um, <laughs> I think he's actually, uh, last I heard he was on Saturday Night Live's The Football TV show. Yeah, I did not know mm. that. Yeah. I don't know Friday, if that's... Friday Night Lights? Yes, that's it. I believe, I believe that he was on that. I don't know. I, I don't know after that, but uh, I remember thinking, oh, of course, he's grown up. Peter Pan was this long ago, of course. Uh, and that's still my favorite version, my favorite live-action version of Peter Pan. Agreed. Same. The music is unbeatable. I actually have that as one of the playlists. I have a playlist with that as the beginning, and then um, uh, the Neverland, uh, the musical uh, about the author oh, of Peter yeah, Pan, uh, James Barry. Never, yes, yes, that, and then uh, I have the the uh, soundtrack to one of the Alice in Wonderland movies that had all the uh, great bands that did covers. So it's just a whole thing of children's different versions of children's things done for more adults. Yeah, uh, but it's still that and Hook oh, are my Hook. two favorite live that actions. Hook. That's true. Hook is such a good movie. It really is. All right, let's rate this movie. See what we give it. Okay, so we'll start with our screens. So yeah, on that one to ten scale, how scary is this movie, Max? Or uh, here, I'll go first. Now. Sorry, Since... I had a blip there. Oh, oh, I just said oh. Max, and then <laughs> no. Um, as far as screens go, of course, this is how scary we think the film is on a scale of one to ten. Um, I gave it a two. I wasn't really scared at any point, but there were some elements that I definitely wouldn't watch my, or let my eight-year-old watch. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give it a three and a half. I feel like the tension is is probably more accurately what it what it is, and and like it, it delivered a lot of really really great like southern gothic tension. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good way to put it, Nathaniel. So, so so yeah, that's 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 where that score is coming from. But yeah, like, um, it, it's more um, ideologically uh, scary than it is, like, uh, I I can't fall asleep. Scary. Agreed, agreed. Um, I would say for scary, it's about a three for me. Some of the jump scares are pretty good and. Mm. Uh, some of the jump scares that the boys do, the, the children, the children do, the shock value makes it scarier. Yeah. Um, especially, especially that scene with, uh, you know, when, when dad gets killed and then yes. uh, Adam still finishes the job. I, I didn't, that, that was probably the most shocking and, and just startling. Um, it's not a movie to keep you up and make it hard to sleep, but it's, but it is in one way, and that is it's one of those movies that makes you go, how much can you trust your mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Crowns, how good do we think the film was? Uh, again, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, uh, I gave it a 5. Uh, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I stayed glued to the screen while I was supposed to be working, so it, it definitely did the <laughs> job. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. 
Um, I'm gonna give it a seven. I I really enjoyed the experience. I think you know I, I would definitely revisit this movie. Um, but you know there's just a few things where you know some of the performances felt a little flat. Some of the scenes were a little bit slow and stuff like that. But um, as a whole, you know, especially considering it's you know a uh, first time you know directorial and and uh, writing uh, piece you know really strong movie that makes me sad that they didn't make more movies together agreed on that uh i was really surprised that there weren't more um i gave i'll do an eight on it and that's because it's one of those movies um that i i watch i keep watching and trying to decide how i feel about it or i see something new each time i watch it mm -hmm. and um and so for me, it's it's going to be an eight just because we can sit down and watch it again and and get something new out of it each time. Fair enough. Okay. Sorry if there's background noises. My my children are being shepherded to bed and are <laughs> weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. Um, How are you staying spooky, Nathaniel? Okay, yeah. So uh, lately, a way that I have been staying spooky uh, has been watching The Midnight Club. I've finally gotten around <gasps> oh, to watching it. I've been meaning to for a long it's time. It's so good. And, yeah, I really like it. I mean, I love everything that Mike Flanagan does. Um, and, you know, so this is, uh, I guess, will be his second to last uh, horror series for Netflix. But it's really good. Um, the The premise for it is just such a, like solid horror premise that it honestly just kind of like pisses me <laughs> off a little bit just you know the idea of like hey here's a bunch of uh teenagers who are terminally ill telling each other stories and making a pact to try to you know give each other clues about an afterlife it is such a great horror premise that it makes me mad that you know christopher pike beat me to it <laughs> by, you know, when i was a small child yeah so there's absolutely no chance i could have ever you know tried to, to beat him to this but you know th yeah i was you know five-ish or whatever when that book came out and yeah i just the whole time i'm watching i'm going i love this idea so much but it also just makes me so <laughs> mad that i didn't get to be the person who who came yeah, up it kind of this. like writes itself a little bit the the show is really <laughs> fluid and beautiful yeah so I, I i'm like seven eight episodes in out of the ten and loving that uh laurel how are you staying spooky lately well Actually, um, I have been watching. I have been watching The Witcher. Uh, I I did not finish the f first series with. Um, oh my God! I have just blanked on his name. I can see his Henry, face. Henry, Henry Cavill. Thank you, <laughs> God, Henry Cavill, who su seems such a nice, wonderfully nerdy yes. person. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I I have to say that I watched The Witcher anyway, but. In the media, at least, Cavell left The Witcher, the show, because it deviated too much from the books. If I didn't love him before, I love him for that. Yeah. Um, so, Witcher, and also, I've started watching Shelter, um, which is uh, based on a book, Henry Corbin. And I'm not sure if it's horror or if it's thriller, because there are definitely horrific elements in it. And... I'm not sure which way it's going to go. I, I've heard good things about that one. I, I've seen, I think Stephen King tweet about it, and I don't know. I, is, I, I want to check it out. Um, it is it is one of those things, it's sort of like the movie we discussed, Frailty, mm. tonight, where you're not sure what's real, what's not, who's telling the truth, who's not, and is it a huge conspiracy or not? And as you get in episode by episode, you learn more. And I'm not sure what the ultimate reveal is going to be. I'm not sure if it's going to be science fiction, horror, or something more, more conspiracy theory, or a little bit of all of it. Well, uh, definitely, I need to watch that sooner than later then. Um, uh, and I will put The Midnight Club on mine. Oh, it's so good. It's yeah, so good. It I, I, I'm smitten with breathtaking. It. Um, 
and I have to watch it before I watch his next series because you know he's uh, coming out with uh, the fall of the house of usher like in a couple weeks maybe even a few days so oh my god and and that was one of my favorite post stories growing up yeah and like the cast is amazing it has freaking mark hamill in it <laughs> plus like a lot of his his uh mike flanagan's usual heavy hitters so um i am like that's that's my phone background right now is fall of the house of usher so it's gonna be amazing um Max, how, how have you been saying Yeah, I have been watching quite a few documentaries lately, aside from reading. I started Tender is the Flesh, and I am on my fifth break because it's just a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, yeah. the documentary I watched last night, actually, is a really awesome one on Amazon Prime. It's called The Unbinding. It's about this really interesting couple um, who... Yeah run a cursed objects museum so they get all sorts of people who send in these cursed objects and then they break the curses and it's about one object in particular that is just really fascinating it has a very cool story and kind of discovery and it goes into slavic paganism and mythology which is right up my alley and i just it was one of those movies that you find out of nowhere and you start watching it and it's amazing. Uh, and I just realized that, um, oh my God, my, my noun server is offline today, um, is that I accidentally picked up a book that, uh, you know, it's not, uh, nor, it's a Nora Roberts book and it's called The Obsession. And you think of Nora Roberts as is traditional writing romance, but this actually has an opening. Uh, this actually has an opening that is as good as any serial killer opening I have ever read. And and it is it is absolutely chilling. the The opening sequence of it was not what I was expecting, um, but but no cheating don't peek at the end uh and the the opening the opening she has enough plot and 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 horror horrific moments in the first less than a third of that book i got through that part and i thought where's the what is the rest of the book going to be about oh my god and it was so well written it was so tight you read the beginning and then you will think it's turned into a different book but wait, it has not. Ooh. Uh, gonna add that to my to-read list. The, the, the opening alone is something that if you want to write um, horror, modern day, real world horror, if you want to write that, if you, it, you should read it and study it. It's that good. Just the opening alone. And you have definitely sold me on that book. Okay. Awesome. Wrap up the podcast. Oh, actually, no. Let's let's have you shamelessly plug the book at least one more time, uh, <laughs> and then we'll we'll. Okay. Um, okay. So the the latest Anita Blake novel, um, Slay, is coming out November seventh. It is the thirtieth novel in 30 years coming out on the 30th anniversary year of the publication of the first novel in the series. And Smolder, uh, which was the 29th novel, is coming out in paperback. I highly recommend you read, you read Smolder and then Slay. If you're new to the series, do Smolder, do Slay, and uh, trust me. Uh, but I am very, I cannot wait to get Slay out there so I can talk to people about it because I'm having to be so good and uh, not, not spoil anything for people who have not read the book yet. And it's not out. Okay. Well, well they, they get to pre-order now then. They do. They get to pre-order now. And, um, uh, and... And you get to read about vampires and other supernatural creatures and see where all that research is on the paper, on the page. Heck yes. 
All right. Well, I guess um, that wraps things up. The only thing left I can think to say is stay spooky.